behalf of the school board and USD 379, I want to welcome everyone tonight to um, our public bond forum. Appreciate, appreciate everyone taking the time to come tonight and listen. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Our purpose is to answer your questions and also to educate. And so uh, at any time, please raise your hand. Let us know if you've got a question. We do have a couple built-in Q&A times throughout the presentation. However, um, if you have a question, please let us know. It's a little different when I can't see the PowerPoint in front of me. I know it's behind me. So um, the first slide we have up there is kind of our goal or objective for this evening. And again, as I just mentioned, and that's to educate our community. Um, there seems to have been misinformation out there for various reasons. Um, we want to make sure we clear that up. Our purpose is not, because we legally cannot ask you to vote yes. Um, we are here again to educate and help you make a decision on November 4th. So as the first slide says, why are we here? It's for the future of our children, of our community, <coughs> and the school district. At this time, I'm gonna take a moment to, uh, to introduce a few people that are here. First of all, our steering committee. Our steering committee is made up of Laura Larson. Sorry about that. I really don't think I need it, but Laura Larson, who could not be here tonight, um, Ted Hayes could not be here tonight, but we do have Monty Green and Jane Jingles, and I'm going to allow those two to say a few things if they would like. And where's that portable mic? Maybe it'd be easier to give that to them. Thank you. Thank you. I think I probably am representing the, the senior citizens of the community when I'm part of this steering committee. But I have two points that I want to mention that are extremely important to me. I'm very positive about Clay County and Clay Center. And I want the families that live here now to want to stay here and raise their children here, because I know what a great place it's been for children to live. I also want people who are looking to relocate and bring new businesses into the community and think about coming to live in our community and our county and our city to look at the school system, because that's the first thing you do when you're going to move somewhere. You want to see what kind of an educational system is available for your children. And I th I'm thinking that the things that are being planned in this bond issue are going to continue to keep our educational system superb at the top. We don't want the surrounding counties and surrounding schools to get that far beyond our capabilities of providing what our children need in this county. Number two, I am very well aware of the tax structure. And I'm interested in the fact that by passing the bond issue now, we do not have an increase in our tax levy. However, if we let the tax levy drop because of some of the changes that have been made, in three or four years, or five or six years, or even 10 or 12, and I'm planning to be around here another 15 or 20 years, I would feel very badly that we'd have a jump in our mill levy. I think it so, makes so much better sense to let us continue paying taxes at the even keel that we are currently having. I don't like jumps in my taxes. 
So that's another reason that I am a proponent of having the bond issues, both of them voted in, because we need to have the facilities that are competitive. We have the educational system that is great for our children, and we need to develop the rest of the facilities in the same manner. And when you think about the ages of our buildings, when you get past 50, like this building is, you have to have a little repair and repairs get expensive when they're left undone. So I hope that you will listen tonight and get answers to your questions and share with your friends that this is an important bond issue for us to pass now, because now's when we need to do the action. Thank you. She pretty well summarized it, um, but I guess to piggyback off of a couple of her points, um, first of all, we do have to consider public perception. And um, the pool issue opened my eyes to that. When you grow up here, you live here, you just don't really think about what other people think of your community, whether they are 45 minutes away in Wamego, Abilene, um, or whether they're 1,500 miles away, and it's a military family considering living here, um, we have to consider what other people and how they view our community. And so I think all of this is ultimately about the kids, but public perception is one more thing that we need to consider. And then regarding her second point and the taxes um, and not wanting a big jump, the school district already has a ridiculously low mill levy rate. And the fact that we're able to consider doing this and not even have to raise an already low mill levy rate is, is crazy. But um, that's a good situation to be in. So um, I, I think you need to consider her second point as well. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Monty. A couple of people that we're going to hear from a little bit later, but I would like to stand and, and introduce Dave Arterbury is our financial advisor with George K. Baum. We're going to hear from Dave here a little bit later. Um, I'm going to try to refrain from talking about finances and stealing Dave's thunder. Um, last night I talked a little bit about it and Dave talked about it, but he's really well versed. We've worked with George K. Baum for several years. Brandon Gibson has been our architect um, with Spanglenberg, Phillips, and Tice. And of course, Brandon has an office here in Clay Center. Um, Greg Jensen is our director of physical plant. Um, there's lots of times that I ask Greg for help. Tonight might be one of them with some questions. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our board members that are in attendance. I believe we just have two, Gene Freegon and Brad Mason. Oh, rats. <laughs> okay, we'll use it then. Uh, really, there's only a couple things I want to touch on. I want to take up a lot of time. As you look at this, just focus on kids, number one, finances, number two. If it makes sense to you, then that's all we ask. If it doesn't, that's fine too. Uh, the other thing that I just want to touch on briefly is a little bit of history of how we got here. Over a year ago, we realized we had the need for a safe room at the middle school. We also knew we had some roofing issues and a few other issues. So at that time, there was no equalization in capital outlay for school districts. The state had done away with it, so we weren't levying anything. We were trying to make that money up elsewhere. And we were we were getting along, but when those bigger items come up, we couldn't handle them. There was still equalization for bond issues. So we thought, well, that's the smart thing to do 
because the equalization, what it amounts to is the state's going to kick in about a third of anything that we come up with. About the time we got started, we found out that we could finance this bond, tie it into what we have left of the current bond, and that would make, make it to where we could do more things. So we added a few things. Then the Supreme Court comes out, tells the legislature, you have to do the equalization. That's, that's priority one as far as being uh, providing an equitable education for all Kansas kids. Well, I'm not going to go into details, but that amounted to way more than what we expected to the taxpayer. When they have to fully fund the LOB, that takes taxes off your plate. Well, we're putting them back, but we're not raising them. We're, we're keeping it flat. The main difference here, we can do everything, everything on that list we can do and keep a flat mill levy for those projects for 15 years. If we do a capital outlay, we can do, we can raise about two thirds as much money over the same time period. So those are the things I'd like you to, to think about as you leave and uh, we'll just go from there. Thanks. I, I, um, I would like to encourage you that if over the last few people's remarks, you're like turned off by the discussion of LOB, capital outlay, general fund, what the state has done, um, we're gonna, you're gonna see some information coming up that's gonna simplify it somewhat. Although I spent about 45 minutes today ex trying to explain this to a, a banker friend and their comment was, which is true, that this is very complicated and it's difficult to understand. But I think we can we can uh, encourage you in that I'm I, I'm as excited about any opportunity that we've had in our community in the last I, I've I've been here 20 years, but I'm not really this age, right? Um, and you get to understanding it a, a little better over time, but you. But this is such a great opportunity for our community to get a lot done for no raise in our mill levy. So as, you, as we go through our presentation and see what we have proposed, remember that the school board is not just interested in um, doing fluffy things. We're interested in our community, countywide opportunities to help us be good for a number of years ahead without spending without raising your taxes and and none of us do this because we um, want to stick it to anybody we love our community and we don't get paid to do this we we want to be here we want to have a great um, community so the things we're proposing have benefits in all regards from reasons why we have parking lots proposed to um, activity centers to fixing roofs to floors and you'll get a lot more details here coming up so Thanks, Brad and Jean. <clears throat> You're going to hear a lot tonight about general fund, LOB, bond and interest, capital outlay. Formulate some questions, and I will, Dave or I, one will try to answer those. I'm one of those, I guess, kind of strange superintendents that I really like working the budget. I really like school finance and understanding the intricacies of that. Um, again, a lot of people don't like that. It is kind of obtuse, it's kind of hard, but um, it's something that I have enjoyed for years. One thing, and then I'm gonna turn it over or we're gonna move forward. Um, so I apologize saying that I wasn't gonna steal any of Dave's thunder, but equalization. A lot of people say, well, equalization, is that local property tax, like on my house or my business or my farmland? That is not. So when you hear equalization or the state's gonna pay 36% of the bond issue if it's approved, that is sales tax and income that goes to Topeka from everybody um, throughout the state. And then it's redistributed. So you're gonna hear a lot about equalization throughout the presentation tonight. 
Okay, going to jump right into it. Um, show you some pictures of some needs. We have flooring there, the big picture. Uh, the largest picture is in Wakefield. That's the main elementary wing, the flooring there. Most of our floors at Wakefield, um, in my opinion, need to be replaced. You can see the window there also needs to be replaced. Most all the windows were done in Wakefield five or six years ago, over a couple years. We have a few that we missed. And then the picture to the right is the upstairs Spanish room at Wakefield. You can see that you've got encapsulated asbestos uh, tile flooring. It's in pretty bad shape. The far um, left, as we look at the screen, is another floor at Wakefield. That's actually uh, Ms. Kimes' classroom. And then the uh, center bottom picture is here at Clay Center High School, flooring with tile. Um, we have lots of classrooms that have mis mismatched, broken tile, squares that um, are gone. So we didn't take pictures at every single classroom or every single hallway, but I think you kind of get the, the idea. We added these pictures today, but we talked about a few windows at Wakefield. These windows are on the proposal to be replaced. They are at the Wakefield Old Gym. You can see some of them are boarded up probably the original windows, so they are to be replaced. We have some windows and doors, of course, throughout the district. That's the fire escape at Garfield, and those windows and doors are both on the schedule to be replaced. This is a picture of right out here outside of the auditorium. Uh, here, I think it was last week, Mr. Young, I think that's correct, that we had rain come through. We actually had uh, some some rough work done, but we had another spot where we had several buckets. I think they just removed those buckets yesterday. Now, not all of our buildings have buckets, but Clay Center High School is a building that we do periodically put buckets to try to stop roof leaks. I noticed tonight, and I wasn't aware of it, right over there along the wall, um, you can see kind of in the middle section, the brown, where we had a roof repaired, where it looks like we had some damage. Yes, whoever has that pointer, thank you. Um, here's a roof at Clay Center High School. Let's go through these pretty quickly. Another roof at Clay Center High School. Another picture of a roof at Clay Center High School. Okay. Garfield. Okay. All right, so pictures of roofs, pictures of some flooring windows. Um, here's our current softball facility that we utilize down at the fairgrounds. Um, yeah, just a minute. We do get some complaints a lot from our visitors about the restroom facilities down there. Um, we've had a few other issues where I was with Mr. Young one time and he got a call from um, one of our visiting parents that fell off the bleachers or a picnic table or something and um, was asking about a work comp and we really didn't know how to address it because the city owns part of it, the county owns part of it, the fair board administers part of it. So yeah, that's, that's been somewhat challenging. Okay, some pictures at Unruh Stadium. Uh, Unruh Stadium, of course, WPA built in 1940, has been a great facility for many years. The picture up in the right-hand column, you can see the rock starting to crumble. There's about six, probably six or eight places, is that right, Greg, um, that you'll find the rock crumbling. There was a rumor out there that Unruh is going to collapse. That's false. It's not. You know, it's structurally not going to fall down. But we did get a bid to have it um, tucked and pointed. It was over $100,000. Probably the bigger issue at Unruh is that our bathrooms are out of compliance. We have no ADA, we have no sidewalks coming off those parking lots that we do not own that go across the city to get to Unruh Stadium. So, a couple pictures. There's a picture of the Wakefield track. You look real close. You could, <laughs> there's no track at Wakefield. It's part of the proposal. Um, the students down there, run on grass or run on the streets. We have 
um, approximately, I think this is based off last year, about 100 students at Wakefield that are out for track between the middle school and the high school. So you'll see the proposal to address that situation as well. Okay, here's the plan at Clay Center Community High School. And I will tell you that the majority of the cost um, here in Clay Center is at the high school. This is the building that probably um, has had the least amount of refurbishing. Um, built in, I think opened in 65. Um, there's been a few things that have been done out of necessity. I think Brad made a good point last night that a lot of the things that have been done and upgraded, like this water deluge system here <laughs> in front of the stage that I believe cost $65,000 was the citation by the fire marshal. I believe we figured we'd spent $218,000 at Clay Center High School because of the state fire marshal citations. Outside of that, we haven't done any major refurbishing. So you can see all the different things that will be addressed in this proposal here at Clay Center High School. Okay, flooring. And I, you know, can't read that legend down there. Um, I believe the, the gray, it looks gray to me anyway, the gray is hard flooring. The pinkish or sandstone color is carpet. Um, the yellow walk-off carpet. So you can see the majority of the flooring here at Clay Center Community High School but would be replaced. And some doors and windows with the triangles and circles. Roofing, um, the majority of the roof would be replaced. Someone I think asked last night, what kind of guarantee, how many years? Um, I think Greg said 15 to 20 is what most roofing companies go with as far as warranty, which we're looking at a 15 year bond. See the 3940 square feet right there with a the question mark? That's right over the auditorium and that was replaced this summer. Actually, they just finished it about a week ago and it was part of an insurance claim. So we went ahead and had insurance money that fixed part of the roof here. The seats that we're setting in right now, original seats, <coughs> excuse me. as part of this proposal, they are um, to be replaced. We would lose some seating because the seats today are wider than the seats that were put in in the mid-60s for probably obvious reasons. I'm, I'm one of them. So um, I also want to mention that up here, the front of the auditorium, there's been some citations as far as the electrical work and the electrical panel and the extension cords and different things that we're going to have to address. And so that would be part of the, the bond proposal. Okay, the district gym, just because it's, I guess, somewhat contiguous with Clay Center Community High School, Everyone realizes that that building's only 10 years old, but um, in the proposal, we're gonna put all new high energy efficiency lighting in all of our gyms. We're gonna go to, I think it's T5s um, from what we have. And then HVAC, basically in this proposal, we're gonna put AC in every gym in the district. And then the flooring right out front in the foyer, um, 268 square feet. It gets lots of traffic, it's in pretty bad shape, so believe it or not, 10 years, we're looking at replacing it. The middle school. Okay, great point. Um, the high school main gymnasium, competition gym, has the original heating unit. I always refer to it as a uh, 747 Boeing up there in the corner that when it comes on, it shakes the seats and rattles and rolls and, and whatever. That is needs to be replaced. And so part of this proposal is to replace that HVAC, that heating unit, and also put AC in our gym. Um, I periodically share with the board that I'll go to a contest and boy, it's hot in the gym in more than just one way. Um, I hear from um, our patrons, I hear from visitors or whatever about how hot it is. Um, so we're gonna hopefully address that. 
There's the middle school. You'll see no roofing at the middle school. That building was built in 1993. But the main thing is the safe room. Um, the safe room is built for, and Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, my memory's short, we talked last night, just over 400, correct? Is that right? Around 400. We currently have 245 students at the middle school. When you figure staff, you're looking at about 275. 400 would provide some growth for a safe room. Um, the regs say five square feet per occupant. I think realistically you're going to jam as many students and staff in there or, or uh, community members as possible. If you had a, a, an event in the gymnasium, if you had an um, academic award assembly or a ball game or whatever, you could about get everybody from the gym into that storage room if it was after school hours. You, safe room, sorry, storage room, safe room. Uh, in the right corner is the proposed middle school safe room. Um, you know, there's been questions for the last year or two about why was a building that was constructed in 93, I mean, why did it not have a basement? And, um, you know, Gene was, I believe, on the board at that time and shared as um, it was shared with me that at that time they said the corridors that were rated at 90 miles an hour were sufficient. And since that time, we've had several tornadoes in the Midwest, Oklahoma City, um, Hoisington, Chapman, Greensburg, Manhattan, Chapman, Joplin, that that's not sufficient. Um, and you're at risk and that you need a safe room. So the only building in the district that does not have a basement. So that is a concrete room. Um, it can be used as a multi-purpose room. We have applied for a FEMA grant. Uh, we made the first round of cuts for that FEMA grant, but we included it in the bond proposal at cost, which is estimated to be just under $700,000, 690000 for a safe room. FEMA will pay up to a maximum of 75%. Sherry found out just today, so this is going to be news to the board as well. We didn't know this last night, that it might be three months to a year before we know whether we're going to be the recipient of those mitigation funds. The difficult thing about that is if we break ground, because that's our number one priority, whether the bond issue or pa passes or not, if we break ground, we lose eligibility for that, for that FEMA grant, that mitigation funding. So that's difficult, but we won't know. We won't know what percentage. It might be a year before we know. Flooring, okay, hard surface flooring. Garfield, roofing, lighting, gym lighting, doors. I might mention that when I say lighting, in the proposal, every classroom in the district would have, I'm going to call it an auto-censoring, occupancy-driven lighting system. Energy efficient, it would have either T5s or T8s, um, and we hope to improve lighting and also improve uh, efficiency. Okay, there's some doors and windows at Garfield. There's the roofing. I believe the other part of the roof that's not included in that has already been um, done, right, Greg, in the last couple of years? Okay, Lincoln. The additional parking lot at Lincoln that was talked about quite a bit, um, the, pro the proposal is to address parking during the school day, not at an event. We have staff that park in the grass around the bus barn. You're going to see in a minute. That works okay until it's rainy and muddy and snowy and, and whatever else, but we are not trying to address when we have a musical at Lincoln. We just, it'd be cost prohibitive for us to build a parking lot that, that big to accommodate the needs there. Okay, there's the part, we'll go back to that parking lot, I'm sorry. You'll see there a proposed 12-stall parking lot. 
right there contiguous with the bus barn. Wakefield facilities, if you read the dispatch tonight, um, you would have read and noticed the things that we plan on addressing there. Again, roofing, lighting, flooring, windows, gym lights, doors, AC in the old gym. Um, Wakefield's competition gym did get AC a couple years ago. And then the new track. Again, gray hard surface, pink or, I don't know, maybe that's salamander. What? Salmon, okay. What carpet? Yes, thank you. A light blue is epoxy flooring that we've been using in our restrooms and in our locker rooms. Roofing? Okay. Whoop. All right, questions that you have to this point before we move on. I know we covered a lot of ground there. We went pretty fast. Any questions? Okay. I don't understand all of the technicalities regarding the lighting systems, but what I'm understanding from hearing is that there will not only be improved lighting, but there will be automatic shutoffs so that when a room is not occupied, the lights will not be on. When the new kinds of light bulbs came out several years ago, I spent a lot of money replacing all of my incandescent lights with those new funny ones. And I have averaged a savings of a minimum of $25 every month on my electrical bill ever since I did that. So what we do with lighting system, I think is something that's very important and I hope that they follow through in all of those areas. I have been told that we're, we're getting fairly close to um, not being able to replace balluses. They're gonna become obsolete, that we're gonna be forced to um, upgrade our lighting. Just to put things in perspective, the school district on an average year, we'll spend between two hundred and fifty and two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars on electricity alone um, for energy. Okay, the athletics that are included in question one. I guess we really haven't talked much about the two questions. We do have question one that has um, some athletics in both communities. The majority of it is infrastructure and academic needs. But what you're looking at in question one is the track at Wakefield, and you're gonna see a picture of that in just a minute. Um, I would have never believed that you could build a track for just over $300,000. Um, the tracks that we're looking at are latex tracks, not polyurethane. Two basic styles, polyurethane and latex, Polyurethane's about double. The current Clay Center High School track is also latex. We've got 18 years out of that track and it's been overlaid one time. The um, Clay Center High School track to resurface, it's more than just resurface. They're gonna take it down to the base and redo it. Um, it's somewhere in the same vicinity as far as cost. The softball complex, includes two fields, concession stand, restrooms, lighting, fencing, I know everyone can read, and that is going to be on the newly purchased 16 acres that's just north of our track here at Clay Center Community High School. The 300 plus parking lot would also be just north of our current track on the, on the 16 acres, right there by the hedgerow, um, north of Prospect, and we hope that not only would that be sufficient parking for athletic events, also help alleviate some of the parking constraints that we see when we have youth activities or we allow youth activities on our facilities. Um, I estimated here a couple weeks ago there was between 300 and 350 cars parked up and down 12th Street and um, Prospect. There's just no place for people to go. So. 
We, we believe that a parking lot's needed. It is not a concrete curb and gutter parking lot. It is an asphalt parking lot that will have lighting. And then a sidewalk as access to the shelter at CCCMS. And you're going to get to see a picture of that in just a minute. Okay, first of all, here's the Wakefield track. It is a 300 meter track consisting of six lanes. There is not room, we've had the architect and engineer look at it, there's not room to put a 400 meter track in Wakefield. So as someone asked me last night, could we host competitions there? Yes, but you're probably gonna host a league meet or a regional meet in Wakefield. You're probably gonna be looking at a small high school meet and a middle school meet, but it'll give them a place to practice, um, to work on things, and actually get our student athletes off the street and off the grass. Okay, this is all part of question one. There's that, if you look far right of the page, there's that 300 stall parking lot right north of Prospect and then there's two softball fields with the concession stands, so on and so forth. There's room, space to grow on that 16 acres. The one thing you did not see this part of question one is the Clay Center track because it's around the proposed multi-purpose complex, which we'll have to show you here in a second. But question two, freestanding question, is for the multi-purpose activities complex inside the track. It addresses the following things. The big thing, it does include field turf. Um, as we looked at this, I know you've read some about it, but we currently maintain and water and fertilize the following fields in Clay Center. The south field, practice field to track, inside the track, the middle school, and Unruh Stadium. We spend more money on water at Unruh than we do the practice fields. But we figured we're spending on average over a two year period, I believe it was about 42 to $44,000. Approximately, and this is somewhat arbitrary, about 50% of that's water. We know water is a precious commodity in Clay Center. We really don't know what water availability is going to be like in 10 or 15 years. I know that just to the west of us in Russell, they just put turf in, and I was told not by their superintendent but by someone else it was because of water availability. The main thing here is efficiency and maintenance. We would go from three fields to one field. None of those fields would need water. The only place you probably would need water would be up around the middle school where they would continue to practice. That's the plan as of now, right now, okay? Are there maintenance costs with turf? Yes. How much? A lot of people say it's a lot less than natural grass. Some say it's about the same, but we do know that there's some maintenance costs with turf as well, okay? I might mention grandstand, go, go ahead, that's, that's okay. The grandstand, right now, Unruh holds about 1,700. The proposed home side grandstand would be about 1,500, and it's aluminum bleachers, it's not a rock or stone complex. That, of course, would be um, too costly. But what you have here in question two, um, you have the new refurbished track, you have the yeah, this is, but the picture is really a question too. But thank you, Gene. The new track, Clay Center is part of question one. But the, the stadium, the field turf, the moving of the runways, pole vault, the concession stand, grandstand, press box, all of that is part of question two. That's all athletics. On the ballot, it's a $2 million question, okay? The turf is, approximately 750,000 of that $2 million. Make sure that you think of it as you're gonna pay 64% of that because you get 36% equalization. As I talk to other superintendents that have put turf in, the one thing that they say 
that you can't put a pencil to is community, usability, and accessibility. Everybody can be on it all the time. The band's on it. The PE classes are on it. The youth teams are on it. The, you know, the football team's on it. The soccer team's on it. Lots of usability and lots of accessibility. And I don't know a superintendent of the state that wouldn't say, liability and safety-wise, that they don't all of their facilities contiguous with their schools and not, you know, spread out throughout the town. So another way to look at it is if we're truly spending $42,000 a year times 10 years, 420,000, you take 750,000, take 36% off that, pretty close to a wash, and then you've got that whole usability and accessibility and future water availability issue. Questions? Now I hear this gets lots of talk in the community. I'd be shocked if we don't have some questions or comments regarding any of the things that we've talked about. The lights? Oh, yeah, it depends on who you talk to. I'm a, um, a conservative life expectancy of turf is eight to 10 years. Many are hoping 12 to 15. Um, I think it was Garden City that, that um, said that they put theirs in maybe in um, 2000 and they just replaced it, I'm not sure. But I read anywhere from eight to 10 to 12 to 15 on the more aggressive estimate. Good question. Another thing you need to keep in mind on the turf issue is when it comes time to replace the turf, the cost is what we're getting is about half of what we're going to have in it the first time because really all you're replacing is the carpet. So that that's a piece of it too. So. Yes. The question is, what are we going to do with the old stadium? That's a good question. It hasn't been decided. There really hasn't been been very much talk at all. Um, I've kind of, without any kind of authority, have said, well, we might, you know, give it to the youth association. Well, they're going to want to play on the new turf if if that stadium um, is approved. There has been a couple people not talk to me but have talked to others in the community in a roundabout way has got back to me that maybe there's some businesses out there along 24 highway that think, hey, that's a prime piece of real estate. There's probably two lots and they're looking to expand. But to be honest with you, no one has officially approached me in that regard. Um, I think that the board kind of felt like we don't want to get the cart before the horse. So I really don't know. There might be someone that would come forward that wants it. Um, I don't know. You want to, board members, anything to add? I don't, I don't think um, that that would happen. There's been a few people say to me interested in preserving it historically, but again, that's people saying to me, you know, that could happen. Um, the retail aspect is probably a stronger possibility. It's right along 24. Um, even the back side of it backs up to a couple of places that could need some space, so. Um, but there's no firm plan, but we're not just, you know, closing our eyes about it, so. And I think, I think really there's, there's two pieces to this what we're going to do with it if the turf goes in and what we're going to do with it if this proposal doesn't fly. Now, I'm reluctant to speak for the board, but my, my best guess would be if this doesn't fly, we're probably going to point and tuck it, try to make some ADA improvements, and that's, that may be it. The, the whole reason that besides the accessibility and the, and the access up here, 
the whole reason the board went there was we were reluctant to spend over a million dollars at Unru to make it like we want it. So, no, I don't think the board's plan would be to let it crumble if this doesn't pass. So. Yeah, I believe I'm speaking for the board. If, if we were like Marysville and their WPA Rock Stadium, which is embedded into the hill that's contiguous with their high school, you might go ahead and spend that money. But when it's not contiguous with the high school, it makes it a little bit more problematic. One other thing as we talk about um, these athletic complexes that I want to make sure I, I clarify is water availability and the possibility of drilling a well. We had been told for years that we had people look into it legally um, that we couldn't drill a well, that we are considered ag commercial. We actually thought it was a city ordinance, but it's not, okay? Um, someone in the community called me, we investigated it, we had our attorney investigate it. What we found out is there's a small use variance that would allow us to jump through lots of hoops. And if we jump through all these hoops and we did the test and the drilling or whatever, at Unruh, there's a chance that we could drill a well. Depends on the Republican Valley uh, water alluvium underneath, but the reality is we were told at best you're going to get junior water rights. Junior water rights means that when you need to pump water, you really can't. You're second and third in line behind ag. Yeah, um, there's a city well down there on the southeast corner. Uh, part of the regulation, you can't be within 150 feet. Um, and I don't know whether we can get around that or not. There, there's a possibility that that could be waived. Now, up around this proposed area, I think that there's a better chance that we could drill a well. When I checked into that, I, and again, it's been a while, but I believe the public variance was 600 feet from a domestic well. I believe there's some houses up on 12th Street that have wells, but we got to be within 600 feet. I think we probably have ample room to have a well up there. But again, there's a few things that we would have to do and a few hurdles we would have to jump. But it's probably more feasible for us to have a well, and we probably need to look into it up around um, these facilities. I can't remember. I don't believe so. Uh, I would want to get back to you on that because there's not a city well up there. The way I understand it, the wells that we're going to compete with and trying to find a vein of water are domestic wells. And so I don't really believe that you're classified as junior water rights. I could be wrong. I would want to double check that before I told you 100%. Good question. Other questions? I would like to think that Clay Center is innovative enough that they could find something that would be a, an activity or uh, something to be done at Unruh Stadium if it were no longer used as part of the facility for the school system. For a long time, I have had a concern knowing my own children and grandchildren, and now I have eight or nine great-grandchildren, uh, I know that no matter how many times you tell them to watch the highway or to dots go, when they see a grandpa or an uncle, it's so easy for them to decide to run. And we have not yet had that happen out at Unruh Stadium. I hate for the thought of that being a possibility. I also wonder, I have wondered how long it might be before Hutchison Mayraff might think that they would have some liability allowing our parking for sports out there and would change their allowing the use of their parking lot. I can only imagine what the people who live in Apollo Towers and Tolan Terrace and Parkview would feel 
like having all of those extra cars parked along Court Street or around their facility. So there are a lot of things to think about when you're thinking about this potential change of getting all of your sports facilities in the same locale. And I like that idea. Now, some of you may not like it, but I just think it makes good sense to have it be a part of the school system and located in the same facility. Thanks, Jane. I've never had any contact with Hutch May Rath saying that, you know, the usability of of the parking lots are going to cease. They've been very supportive of our schools. Um, anyone wants to address that, they can. But I mean, you can't ever say, wish we could, that no one's ever gonna get hurt, whether it's out there around that stadium or up here by the proposed one, that's being unrealistic. Um, because again, I've heard from people that are concerned about all the cars that are parked up and down 12th Street on a Saturday morning. Um, and I've had people approach me about petitioning the city for no parking on 12th Street. And I, we have no jurisdiction of the streets. Um, we, we just don't. And I said, you know, if we could get this parking lot proposed or we could get this parking lot passed that's proposed, then yeah, I might be willing because I'm not gonna want people parked there on 12th Street watching a ball game. I'm gonna want them to park in the parking lot where they can go through and pay gate. So, yeah, yes. How are you gonna get someone in a wheelchair from there up to the stadium? Build what? It, we have, um, we had a joint meeting in the early spring. Uh, I believe the, the school board had had offered to a certain amount to, uh, to help refurbish. But again, I think the general philosophy there is it's pretty hard to take taxpayers' money and pick up uh, and fix up facilities that you don't own that are not contiguous with your own facilities. Um, and I, again, I don't want to speak for the board, but I believe that's a general philosophy there. As far as, um, you know, the most recent thing that came out in the paper, um, we sat at a meeting, and I believe there was board members there, um, there was other administrators, and we were told that they had no money at that time to fix up the softball fields at the fairgrounds. They did, the way I remember it, okay? The way I remember it, they said they might be able to get some people to help, um, kind of like what's going on at Campbell Field, that they might be able to get some farmers to move some dirt and do some other things, but they did not have the budget to address the needs down there. Now, I've read recently something has changed, but no one has contacted me. And I have visited with, um, I was one of the people at that meeting and um, Mr. Thurlow was also there and we had a, you know, it was a very good meeting for all of us. And he did state that they didn't have any money at the time, which we all already knew, which is fine. Um, and then he has since told me that they have t decided to budget some money towards improvement of the fairgrounds. Now. It's a, it's a sticky issue for all three entities involved because the county owns the ground, the city owns the fences, the scoreboard, the bathrooms and the other things. And so if we would put money into the fairgrounds, we would have to do it in a lease form, um, an increased lease because legally we're not allowed to pay money for improvements that we we don't actually own so that was the whole discussion and um evidently they have decided to to put some money into the fairgrounds and i think it's wonderful that they're going to do that but remember also that even if we build our two uh, two softball fields at our facility up here and or a track or a field or anything 
anybody in the community is welcome to use it. It's open for the public. Um, you can hold tournaments there. And my other point is if we have two here, we, two is not enough for an effective, um, for, for example, softball tournament. We would still need to use the fairgrounds also. So we, we view it as a um, collaboration, a cooperation, and have a great desire to work together with the rest of our community to make us all have better facilities. So we have investigated that. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Jean clarified that we cannot use taxpayers' dollars to fix up someone else's facilities unless they charge it through a lease. We can go into a lease agreement with the city on Campbell Field or with the fairgrounds or the county, but we truly can't lease our facilities out. We can go into contract with them. I think Sandy has a question. You want to, Jacqueline? Can you tell us how much the school district's been paying on an annual basis to uh, use those softball fields, or if there isn't a dollar amount? I don't believe that we've been charged. What we've, what we've tried to do, um, again, Wade Bauer had his hand in it for a long time. I'm not sure he still does, but um, the bees would possibly buy the, would buy the, the covering for the ground and then we would buy the scoreboard or the fence or we would apply the grass with our tractors or whatever. So it had been somewhat collaborative, but I don't believe in our lease agreement, right, bud, Robert? There's, we have not been paying um, for... We did pay lighting? That's Mr. Weller back there who was our athletic director here at the high school the last two years. So. Thank you, Matt. My other concern is I do a lot of running and driving up around where the track is now on 12th and Prospect. That street is horrible if you drive it or walk it or run it. There's no shoulders. There's no curbs. Um, you're, you're taking your life into your, your own hand if there's nobody parked on either side and you meet traffic. My concern is that needs to be upgraded before we ever put anything more up in that corner because it's too dangerous the way it is now, let alone on a Saturday morning when you've got traffic up there and parking. So what is the cost to improve that? If it's a shared cost between the school district and the city, how much is it? To me, we've got to know that cost before we know whether this is a, something we want to pass. Well, Sandy, I can't give you specific amounts. I have no idea. I'm not sure even the city knows. I will tell you this. Um, first of all, I will agree that 12th Street and Prospect are in a bad way and they need to be addressed. I did call Mayor Jimmy Thatcher and we have talked about this and we both agreed that it is a positive for Clay Center that the um, sales tax for city streets were, was reauthorized. So I believe the money is there. It's just whoever the power is to be to make the decision on which street becomes priority, it's in their court. Like, you know, I have no power, no say there, anything to do with the city streets. And actually, Mayor Thatcher doesn't make that decision either. But we did talk about that that's an issue that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed now. Um, it will be a bigger need if uh, these proposals go through. I understand that. So I don't know if I helped at all, but that's what I know. Oh. Gary, I have no idea. Gary's question is, uh, are those streets owned solely by the city or is it a joint between the city and the county? I have no idea. At one time, um, and I know this because when Clay Center Middle School was built, it, I think I spent five years on this project, but um, Ninth Street is, was at the time halfway in the city and halfway in the county. That's why Ninth Street for so long was about three quarters paved. And I don't know if they came to an agreement or, or even annexed the, the rest of that street to be city. 
but as far as I remember, um, Prospect and 12th are city. But that's just what I remember, so. And again, I want to make it clear that um, Mayor Thatcher's conversation in mind was just on the surface talking about a, you know, a potential problem um, without any true resolution to it and no authority by either one of us to say this is going to become priority. I will tell you, as far as the school district and our budget, we legally cannot take LOB, capital outlay, or bond and interest to pay for streets, illegal. I called the State Department last week because I thought that question might come up. You can use your general fund budget. In reality, everyone's general fund budget is really tight, and you don't have the wiggle room in your general fund budget to, and again, an arbitrary number, give the city $100,000. You can. I'm not proposing this. It's not part of our, our bond proposal. There is a place in the budget for special assessments. The district can generate a tax for 20 years to pay for a special assessment. I do know that. And I found that out last week because I had no experience in that area. Tell them what okay. the majority of our general fund is used for. Well, about 85% of your general fund budget is for salaries and insurance. When you figure classified, certified um, salary. And you know what? That would emulate every school district in the state. They're all somewhere 80, 85 percent. You know, I think the special assessment and those kind of taxes are what scares the people in this community that are on a fixed income. Um, you know, when we look at the taxing situation with the sales tax that we've passed to support the new pool, to do the streets, which granted those things need to be done. But I think that's what frightens the people that the, there's some other hidden taxes that will, will surface. And when you're on a fixed income, I think that's a real concern. Well, what's that? OK, I'm just going to address that question. And I've been asked to move on. Um, if I would have known about the special assessments or if that question would have come up earlier, I would have definitely shared that. I'm not trying to hide anything. That's the only vehicle that the school district has. I can tell you right now, and I think I'm probably speaking for the board, that they're not going to sit here and say, we're going to be able to do something and not raise the mill levy rate and then come right out and raise the mill levy rate. They would have to make adjustments elsewhere if that's where we ended up. I do think, again, it's a positive that the sales tax initiative for streets was reauthorized, and there's going to be money there to fix streets up in Clay Center for many years. It's just which streets are going to get prioritized are going to become priority. OK, let's move on. Brandon, que any questions for Brandon Gibson, our architect? Correct. Correct, yes. Okay. Um, that's a question that I have, no one has called me about, they've called me about water and wells and alluviums and those kinds of things, but not about the water coming off the proposed parking lot. Would you put that picture up, please? Is it okay if I answer this question? <laughs> we, we want to move on to the finances here real quick. But, um, okay, that's 16 acres. You see those softball fields? Um, I think people are concerned that the water coming off that parking lot is going to cause problems, okay? We are currently under contract with a civil engineering firm, Swab Eaton, out of Manhattan, and they're doing right now a hydrological study of that area. We met with one of their engineers, um, Greg, when was that, last week or the week before? Two weeks ago, we looked at our drawings and our map, I will tell you this, that if you split that going north and south, about half 
the east half of that 16 acres actually does not flow to the west or to the south. It actually, the water is going to be diverted and it's going to go northeast. There's about approximately half, again, I'm not a civil engineer, okay? There's about half of that 16 acres and about half of that parking lot that's going to head west, okay, southwest. We have a rather large detention pond right there where Jacqueline's circling in front of the middle school. Um, the initial review, they looked at that area. They looked at where it goes underneath Prospect. There's a big grate and tunnel that then goes underneath 9th Street and then runs towards 8th Street. The initial thought was, we look to be in great shape. I said, I need that in writing from someone that's an engineer and to do the full hydrological study, okay? We're estimating that's gonna cost us, I think they said $3,000 to have that done, so we know. But I don't believe we've got a problem there, okay? But we've got a civil engineer looking at it. I hope I, I answered that question. Um, one of the things I found out, which was interesting, and I told Mayor Thatcher this, when you're going down 9th Street south, right there in front of the middle school, the city street dumps into the district's detention pond. I don't know what that means, but I learned something. I didn't know. So my point is, we're already working together. We're allowing the city to dump into that detention pond. It's, it's a large area. So, okay. Anything for Brandon? Brandon, you want to address anything? Huh? You, you want me to stay behind the mic? <laughs> okay. We're going to turn it over to Dave now and talk about some financial stuff. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to be covering um, oh, some of the stuff that typically isn't all that interesting when talking about a bond issue. But in this circumstance, I think this is um, a, a pretty interesting set of facts. Um, you know, based on three different uh, uh, sort of, hold on a second. Based sort of on three different um, factors that are coming into play here, the district should be able to accommodate both a question one and question two that are being proposed without a mill levy increase, without an increase in property taxes. And the way they're able to do that is really through three things. It's through um, the equalization that Mike mentioned, and I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. It's through the structure of the new bond payments. Um, at, you might have heard it referred to as the wraparound payment structure. Uh, and it's also due to the school district's ability to adjust some of its current tax rates that it, that it levies for some of its different operating funds. So the combination of these three things should allow the district to, um, to, to undertake these bond issues and not have to increase the mill levy. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the equalization. And again, what equalization is, is it's money that the state is going to be giving to the school district uh, to help make its bond payments. Um, this, the school district receives equalization in a variety of its different funds and accounts. It gets equalization to help pay teachers' salaries. It gets equalization to help um, maintain facilities. Uh, it also gets equalization to help make its bond payments. Uh, right now, based on the school funding formula, the district will receive state aid or equalization each year equal to 36% of its bond payments. What that means essentially is the state is giving to the district a little more than a third of the bond payments each year. I, I think yesterday in Wakefield, somebody had said that that's kind of like somebody giving you one dollar for every two dollars that you're paying for a project. Um, now somebody might say, well, how do you know the state's going to continue to give that money to the school district? And that's a very fair comment. Um, and I guess the way I would respond to that is that um, the school funding formula as it currently exists has been in place since 1992. Um, this, the state has reduced or changed the funding that it gives for 
a lot of different uh, uses that the school district gets money for. A lot of the different equalization that the school district gets from the state, um, those funding levels have been changed over the years. The one exception to that that I'm aware of is the equalization that the state gives school districts for bond and interest payments. That has remained in effect and unchanged in the last 20 years. Now, now the amount that a district gets can change each year. Um, you know, right now, the school district gets 36%. Um, historically, that has been a pretty stable amount. Historically, they've been always been getting about 36%. It might change a few percent each year, but it's going to probably be consistently around 36%. Now, going forward, there's nothing that says the school district couldn't eliminate that. Um, and in fact, there have been some legislative proposals over the last couple of years to, to do away with the state equalization that is received for the bond payments. Um, however, every time one of those bills has come up, it, it's never been a bill that has attempted to remove the equalization that has already been granted to a bond issue. Uh, all of the proposals that have been uh, introduced in the legislation, none of which have been successful, but all of the ones that have been introduced eliminate it for new bond issues going forward. Um, I think the thought is that, is that once a school district uh, has an election and passes a bond issue, um, that the taxpayers are counting on that equalization to come in to help make the future bond payments. To remove it would put a significant additional tax burden on the property taxpayers, and quite frankly, they, I think it would really cause a real revolt, um, and the legislators up in Topeka would hear about it. So th that's uh, one piece of um, what's going into being uh, allowing the school district to do the bond issue without a tax increase. Um, on this next page here, the, uh, I'm going to attempt to talk a little bit here about the, the second piece of it, which is how the bond payments are structured. There's a lot of numbers on here. Um, this was a sheet that we had prepared uh, a number of months ago to try to show the school district what the tax rate would be that would be necessary to repay bond issues uh, of certain sizes repaid over certain periods of time. And if you look here, in, sort of in the bottom on the middle, you'll see a blue box that says 3.662. What that is, is that represents the mill levy, the tax rate that would be needed by the school district to repay a $9.5 million bond issue over a 15-year period of time. Now, the actual election amount, when you include both question one and question two, is more like about $9.7 million. It's $9.76 million. So that, that mill levy actually is about, that, that will be required, will be about 3.8 mills. Now, a lot of people, myself included, uh, up until a few years ago, didn't know exactly what a mill was. Um, so let me try to put it into some, some simple terms. Um, if you own a $100,000 home, a, a home that the county appraises at $100,000, one mill equals approximately $1 of additional taxes per month. Um, it's actually about 96 cents, but rounded, it's about $1 a month. So in this case, if you own a $100,000 home and the mill levy was, as I mentioned, about 3.8 mills, that's roughly $3.80, a little bit less than that, of additional taxes per month. Um, now the reason you'll see in here, for each of those different years, the 10-year, 15-year, and the 20-year issue, you'll see a level, level payment structure and a wraparound structure. Um, now, what we're referring to here is how the bond payments are structured. And this is the second piece of the equation that is keeping um, this as a no tax increase bond issue. The school district currently has some bond payments um, on its old debt that has already, have already been issued. Those bond payments go out right now, they're scheduled to go out until 2019. And after that, they're gone. 
Now, one way we could structure the new bond issue is to have the new bond issue have level payments each year, just like a mortgage, where it's level for the next 15 years. Well, if you did that, you'd be adding the new payments right on top of the old payments. And when the old payments disappear in 2019, you'd have a big drop off. You'd have the amount of debt payments would drop significantly because those old bonds would be gone. That would be a level payment structure. And if you were to do a bond issue of this size using a level payment structure, you'd need about a, you know, a 6.3 or 6.4 mil increase. We, can, we don't have to structure the bonds with level payments. And in fact, a lot of school districts don't do that because a lot of school districts have bonds already outstanding. What we instead can do is we can, um, in the early years, in the first four years of the bond issue, between now and 2019, we can schedule the payments on the new bond issue to be lower. And then in 2020, when the old bond payments drop off, we can increase the new bond payments. And the idea there is that when you add the two payments together, the old and the new payments, overall, you'll have a, a flat payment going forward for the next 15 years. That's why we call it wrap around. We're, we're wrapping the new debt payments around the old payments. Um, and, and by doing that, you can keep the mill levy down from about 6.4 mills to about you know, the 3.6 or 3.8 mills that I mentioned. So that's the second piece of the puzzle. Now the third piece has to do with the school district's current taxes. What you see on here um, is the school district's, the makeup of their current tax rate. Um, and you'll see, let's look at this middle bar, which represents the tax rate currently for the school district for the 14-15 school year. You see there, there are four different taxing funds that the school district has. The light blue down at the bottom is the general fund. This is the fund that salaries and insurance and utilities are all paid out of. The red bar is the supplemental general fund, or the, lo the LOB, which also is a fund that teacher salaries and utilities and operations are paid out of. The yellow fund is the capital outlay fund. Now, this is the fund that um, is legally restricted in, in terms of what you can use those monies for. It can be used to maintain facilities, it can be used to replace windows, it can be used to acquire buses, it can be used for capital projects, it can't be used for operating costs. The district's current budget has 5.5 mils for the capital outlay. And then the final bar, um, piece of that bar up there at the top is the bond payment. Currently, the school district's bond payments are uh, require about 3.9 mils. So in total there, there's about 44.6 mils. Now, if the bond issue is successful, as I mentioned, it's gonna take about 3.8 mils to pay it off. That 5.5 mils that is currently being levied for capital outlay expenditures, things like window replacements, floors, roofs, a lot of those projects can be funded with the bond issue. So the school district isn't going to need 5.5 mils going forward to fund its capital outlay expenditures. Instead, it can shift those mills and put them into the bond and interest levy. So the bond and interest levy will go up and the capital outlay mill levy will go down. So the overall result is um, that the school district, uh, if things hold as planned, should be able to accomplish the, um, the bond issue without a tax increase. Um, now obviously a lot can go into this, a lot can change, um, but really this is, uh, I think, a very achievable goal, and I think it's something that is um, within the control of the school district to, um, to, to accomplish. Uh, now you'll notice one thing here, um, the, the bar over to the far left-hand side, that represents the school district's mill levy last year, a total of 44.844 mills. You'll notice in there, the LOB, that red mill levy, was significantly higher 
last year than it is this year. The reason it dropped so much was because, as um, Mike had mentioned earlier, that there was a Supreme Court ruling this past year, actually this current year, that essentially required that the state start funding schools um, as they had originally promised. In other words, some of this equalization money that the state was supposed to be giving that they had cut back in order to save on their budget, the court said, you've got to start giving that back. When they did that, uh, when they required that the state give the money back to the schools, that caused the, the local option budget to decrease. The school district filled in that decrease by implementing a capital outlay levy that we now are going to be able to use to reduce, to, to accommodate the new bond issue without a mill levy increase. So, um, no, that's fine. Go ahead, please. Um, so th those are the three components that will go into keeping the mill levy flat, uh, even with the bond issue uh, being added on. Just as a comparison purpose, though, we thought it would be good to show you some mill levies for other school districts around the area and around the state. And you can see here, um, Clay County USD 379, the total mill levy, and this is last year, 44.844 mills. Um, the average in the league is um, 49.593 mills, and then you can see some of the other averages in the area. But w what I think you'll notice is that um, this, your mill levy, the current mill levy for the school district is um, lower than not only the state average, but lower than a lot of the other surrounding school districts, um, too. You're, you're in a um, very fortunate position in that way. I mean, nobody likes to think that their taxes are low, but relative to a lot of other districts in the state, your, yours are on the low end. In the bottom 20th of overall in the state. Um, okay, if you want to go ahead and turn. Um, there's, there's some questions about how much of each of the different ballot questions um, was comprised of athletic facilities. And this just attempts to show that question one, which is the bond, is the ballot question for $7.7 .7 million um, that consists of a lot of the, the, the windows, the flooring, um, the roofs, um, the softball fields, th that is 85% uh, for facilities costs and 15% for athletics. When you look at question one and two, and question two is entirely athletics. If you look at questions one and two together, it's 66% facilities and 34% uh, athletics. And again, the two questions are completely independent, so you can vote on for one and not for the other if you choose. Um, on this page, um, Mike had called uh, the Department of Education and found something kind of interesting. Um, the, when a school district, before they hold an election, a school district has to determine whether or not they've exceeded the statutory debt limit. And in Kansas, the statutory debt limit is 14%. In other words, the, the debt of a school district um, cannot exceed 14% of its assessed valuation unless prior to holding an election for bonds, you go to the state and get approval. So if a school district is going to exceed the debt limit, before they hold their election, they have to file an application with the State Board of Education to hold their election. Over the last two years, uh, there have been a total, if you add these together, a total of 51 elections held in the state. Um, of those 51 elections, 45 of those uh, exceeded their 14 percent debt limitation. And I think that number is um, something along like 85 percent of all school districts that are holding an election are exceeding the 14 percent statutory debt limit. Um, Clay Center or Clay County Schools is not in that 85 percent. Clay County Schools falls would fall under the smaller category, which is districts that are not exceeding their statutory debt limit. I guess what that's telling me is that um, 
you know, despite undertaking a, a significant borrowing, um, $9.7 million of, of new debt, you're still uh, taking on and will have a debt burden that is a lot smaller than most other school districts that are looking to borrow money these days. Uh, I think it's just that that's just a situation where I think um, you know, your facilities and, and your needs and the projects that you are undertaking aren't, aren't nearly of the magnitude that other school districts have been asking the voters to approve. So, I, think, I, think, I think that's it. I so I'll turn it back to Mike and obviously be happy to answer any questions. Dave. Gene, comment. Before I forget, our assessed valuation in the school district, just over 81 million, okay? Um, and we talk about equalization, I always use this analogy. It's a simple one. Burlington has a nuclear plant. They have 800 students. One mill generates $550,000. Their assessed valuation is 550 million. Galena, 800 students. Their assessed valuation is 35 million, one mill raises $35,000. You see why you have equalization, because you can't provide a fair and equitable education throughout the state of Kansas without that equalization. Our assessed valuation um, in our district is 81 million. Just real quick, um, a little earlier I asked Mike if we could move on to the financials, and the reason was to help address Sandy's question about what would we do if there was a, like an assessed cost for a street. Um, as you, if you recall the, the bar graphs that we had, if we had to assess to pay for a street, which we don't know if we would or not, um, we could reduce another area, perhaps capital outlay, to make up for the assessed part so that we could still have a flat mill levy. It is the intent of this board, and they've been very conservative for the whole time I've served on this board, not to raise taxes unnecessarily. In the last 10 years, we've... Different than it was 10 years ago. So we have the intent to do that. We're not into raising the mill levy. And this is a wonderful opportunity to accomplish a lot in our district without doing that. So the, I was wanting to just kind of address that. Questions? Yes, Suzanne. Jacqueline, where's your? I'm coming. Oh, OK. You're running the what? Go. Oh, you had the chop over, okay. There are a lot of projects that are, are planned with this. What's the time frame that, that you're hoping to be able to accomplish the work on the buildings? And That's a great question, and that question came up last night, and I kind of off the cuff tried to answer it, and, and Brandon actually emailed me today, our architect, with some additional information. But if the bond passes in November, question one, question two, both, whatever, you're gonna sell those bonds sometime in February, correct, Dave? And then, once they're sold, you can get started. Now, I think there's a lot of factors and variables there. School's in session, the weather, contractor availability, all those things. But, um, you know, our number one priority in our response last night was safe room, okay? However, with the information that Sherry found out today, I'm not sure whether we'll start on that, not knowing whether we're gonna get that mitigation funding. So you've got all those other things. I would hope that we would get started on some of them in the spring, some of them in the summer, and hopefully by fall, the majority of them would be done. But again, I've worked with contractors long enough to know that sometimes um, it's, it's difficult to pull those things off. Brandon, do you wanna share so I, I don't, mess it up, the information you gave to me uh, today. Put him on the spot here, he needed to talk. I can share some uh, estimated timelines for at least some of the athletic portions of the work. Um, 
like the the track at Wakefield. Um, that would take six to eight weeks to construct that track facility there. So that could easily be done over the summertime when, when the facilities are not being used. Um, the Just to resurface the, the high school track, that would be a four week project. So fairly easily done as well. Um, if the if the turf um, part of the, the bond questions is is approved, then the the athletic facility at the at the high school, then we'd be looking at 12 weeks for that, and that that would include the resurfacing of, of the track. So um, they're all very doable um, time frames. Also, when you when you get into doing at least the athletic facilities, you're going to be dealing with a contractor that does these type of facilities, and they're used to the school's time frames and what the school has to has to deal with. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Jacqueline um, put a little bug in my ear and said, "Mike, don't forget to mention because." Anytime you talk about athletics, it becomes, I guess, emotional or intense. But 80%, roughly, of the students in USD 379 are involved in an extracurricular activity between Wakefield and Clay Center. 80% of our 1,400 students. So we know it's important to them. 6th to 12th, thank you for the clarification. How much money do we truly spend? when you figure transportation, maintenance, upkeep, all that, when you combine the LOB and the general fund, it's about 4%. A lot of people think that it's much, much higher than that. And that's one of the reasons we put that um, in our annual report. You know, USD 379 is a great school district. Academically, we do very well. I could set up here, but just right there in front of you, how well our students do academically. We have some of, when I bring in visitors, other superintendents, guests, parents, our vocational facilities are some of the best in the state for a school district our size. When they go to our shops, they go, wow. When they walk in here, now it maybe needs a little TLC in seating or whatever, but they comment, wow, you've got great fine arts facilities. Those are very, very important. I think we have an opportunity here to do something to, first of all, address safety, infrastructure, efficiency, and academic needs, but also to address some facility wants, needs, is for you to decide. So um, let's go to the FAQ, Jacqueline. The, the steering committee kind of challenged us before we had our meeting last night with some questions that you know they thought might come up. I'm not gonna read, I hope you can see that, but we tried to address those. If you have questions from those, please let me know. I don't wanna be redundant. Okay, I fibbed. I am going to address this one because Brad talked about it. Okay. Word I was. Okay. <laughs> some might ask, because it was asked last night, how come some of these things weren't done over the years? They were, but there was no equalization in capital outlay. It was going to be on the taxpayers dollar for dollar. So we tried to get more bang for our buck and our taxes and do it through LOB. So we were taking the extra in LOB and spending about $125,000 a year in maintenance projects. Well, we survived, but we didn't really keep up, okay? So we now have, after we started this whole process, we have equalization in capital outlay. That's why we took the savings in LOB and put it in capital outlay this year to keep it equal. We talked, I talked the board they talked to me can the board do some of this stuff through capital outlay that now we have equalization the answer to that is yes they can here's the difference 
by using a wraparound financing. 3.6 mills in an approved bond issue is going to generate nine and a half million dollars that we're going to have as soon as we sell those bonds in February. Okay? Now, you're not going to see a tax increase because we're going to lower the capital outlay. But still, there's 3.6 3 there's mills. Those same 3.6 mills in capital outlay that now has equalization that hadn't in the past, on the 15th year, will generate $6 million. Okay? The voters actually, I mean, you can always say, well, the voters vote the board in, and so you have representation, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, without going to the voters in a referendum, the board can say, okay, we're just going to put 3.6 mils in there. In the 15th year, we're going to have generated $6 million, and we're going to address those needs. We're going to chop away at them. Or you can do $9.5 million for the same mill levy. The other thing that, for me as superintendent, that is profound, if you tie up all your mills in capital outlay trying to do these projects, we don't have any autonomy. We can't, if we get in trouble or we need new buses or whatever, if you use those mills for capital outlay, you don't have as much autonomy to use that for other needs. It just gives you autonomy, wiggle room. So that's why it's being proposed the way it is. So does that make sense? Brad, did I cover it? Yeah. Question on that. Yeah. The, the 3.6 came off Dave's chart that showed 9.5. It's actually going to be about 3.8. And I've also had questions. Based on the district's assessed valuation, will that mill levy rate go up or go down? And the answer to that is yes. It takes the same amount of dollars to make that payment. Our current bond and interest payment I believe in Kathy's way there in the back, but it's she makes it, I budget it. But it's five hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars. Hundred and ninety thousand of that's an equalization. We're currently getting to thirty-six percent. When I came to the school district, the assessed valuation was about fifty million. It's now eighty-one million. The mill levy rate has lowered in bond and interest. The payment remains $535,000. Takes the same dollars to pay that payment. If the assessed valuation goes down, could that mill levy rate go up? Yes. Takes the same dollars to make that payment, the same number of tax dollars. I've had that question, that's, and that's hard for people to understand. Questions? Firm bids, no. You want to address that more? These are estimates, projections. We've had a couple engineers that work for Brandon's architectural company that have um, they've done an analysis, they've studied it, but um, the issue is we can't go over whatever the bond was issued. If the bond's issued at 9.7 and it comes in at $10 million, the board's going to have to cut $300,000 out of it. They're going to have to prioritize. If they come in, and this probably never happens, does it, Brandon? Maybe you don't want to answer that, but um, it's probably not going to come in at 9.4. But if it does, then the board, after the referendum, I think Dave clarified this last night, could issue a lower amount. Not saying we would. Hypothetically, let's say that the mitigation or the FEMA money comes in and we get, again, an arbitrary number, $300,000, could the, bit, the board issue fewer dollars of that approved $9.7 million? Answer to that's yes. Did I say that right, Dave? Yeah. Okay. No. If, if, the, if you sell the bonds and then the bids come in less and you've already issued $9.7 million of bonds, in that case, what could two things could occur first of all 
if there were other projects that the school, school board wanted to undertake that, that were permitted based on the wording of the ballot question, the school board could elect to use the money for those purposes. The alternative is it could take those extra dollars and put them back into the bond fund to help reduce the property tax levy. Jacqueline has a slide up here that we researched first part of the week when I called the Kansas State Department of Education, talked to Brad Nunswander, uh, or excuse me, Craig Nunswander, finance director. Those 45 bonds for the last two years, the average amount was 31 million. I hosted the NCKL superintendents here today for a, one of our three meetings throughout the year. Abilene just passed a $24 million bond um, just a few months ago. I think it was June, wasn't it? It was in April. So, yeah. Currently, including our referendum, there's 15 on the docket this year. Those average 26 million is the average bond. We're at 9.7. Do we have any more slides, Jacqueline? Questions. Surely that we have more questions. What can we clarify? Ooh, that's a that's a good question, Dennis. Um, I believe when we started looking at this, we were talking at about two and a half percent, and it's a little bigger than that right now, right, Dave? About three percent. Yeah. Right now, I would anticipate that if, if the bonds were to be sold, the interest rate would be somewhere between 25 and 3%. The, the projections that we ran, just to be on the safe side, assume that interest rates were at 4% when the bonds were sold. If, if, they should be, if they should remain stable at current levels, then the mill levy required would be less, and obviously the ability to do this without a mill levy increase is even more secure. And the other thing is, you figured a flat assessed valuation over the life of the bonds, 15 years. The 10 years that I've um, had the privilege to be a superintendent of this district, nine of the 10, the assessed valuation has gone up. We've only had one. Now, this year was a little lower. It was 2.8%. Some years, you know, we saw 5 7% increase in assessed valuation. My point is very conservative in our estimations there. Dave can answer that question better than I can, Dennis. So, other questions? Yes, Sandy. You just said assessed valuations have gone up in the last. I had a question last night before I attempt to answer that or pass it off to Dave about what percent of our taxes that come to the school district, which right now with the legislative change, do you realize that even the 20 mills for general fund no longer come directly to our office? That all goes to Topeka. So the local banks are affected by that. We don't get to distribute our money and get that, you know, whatever interest rate is. But it all goes to the peak and all comes back in the way of equalization. But I truly don't know the breakdown of what ag land is versus business um, and personal property. Now, I, I like Dave. I can talk about mill levy rates and I can tell you how it affects 160 acres of row crop versus pasture land versus a business versus a house. But I think he did a real good job of explaining the simplicity of that. I guess there's nothing simple about mill levies. But I truly don't answer, but I, I don't know how to answer that, but I got that question. But I do know, talking with Steve McAnally um, a few months ago, that the assessed valuation in the city of Clay Center actually went down a little bit. But overall, we saw a 2.8% increase, and that's because of ag land. 
ag land is, is assessed, the formula is different, where a business or a home is based on the value, land is based on production. And it's like a six year cycle and there's many counties that are involved in it. And I, I think maybe two years ago, I had a local farmer tell me that they saw a 20% increase um, in the assessed valuation because of that ag production. But I truly don't know what percentage makes up of our taxes, but I will tell you this, and I think this is really profound. Of our general fund budget, the 20 mills flat across the state, every school district's the same, right? Everyone gets 20 mills. That generates about 1.5 million of our eight and a half million dollars locally, a 15%. So we get about 85% of our general fund paid for through equalization. Of our LOB, local option budget, it's supposed to be 54% because of the assessed valuation per pupil. That's really complicated. The state started cutting us. They appropriated it at about 75%. Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That's not fair. We got that money back. The taxpayer saw the savings in those six mills. We turned right around and put that in capital outlay because of our mill levy rate and because of being able to have equalization and capital outlay as well. I still didn't answer your question because I don't know how to answer it, but I know a little bit about some of those other things. Questions? The only, the only other thing I would say, and I'm not sure how much money you're writing up on this. If, if the valuation of the property goes down for the, for the purposes of the bond, the mill levy is going to go up. But for the landowner, the tax bill is going to stay the same. So if you buy a new car and you have a $400 car payment, you're going to have a $400 car payment no matter what. The assessed valuation, your income or your decline in your income, you've still got a $400 car payment. It'd be the same for the school district. I will tell you that in before 92, the new finance formula, we received 34% equalization on bonds. It changed in 92, so since 92, it's been 36%. So there's been equalization because of disparity in wealth for a long time. And Dave nailed it, that's not gonna go away. I talked to the State Department, the only thing I would add to what Dave said is, if they tried to cut that equalization once a referendum was passed. Our bond rating would have stayed the same. Yes, Chris. Why was the land purchased before the, I'm going to pass that to one of the board members. I, I can talk to it. I guess it's one of those deals that we had the opportunity to purchase the ground and we had a short window to do it. We've, we've been trying to do that for quite some time. Finally got things worked out, but it had to happen or not. I, I can answer that. I think Gene wants to. Um, I, I'll just piggyback on Brad's comment. I think that long-term planning and vision for the district, the worst thing for a district is to be landlocked. Talk to Marysville. If you have an opportunity to buy land that's contiguous with you for future planning, I think that's a smart move whether you put facilities on it or not. I really do, because value of land's not going down, and when you have an opportunity, and Brad's right, we've, we had tried to buy that land for several years and were not successful. The window opened up. We bought it. Realized that there was some scrutiny that came along with that. We've already heard a proposal, or I received a proposal from our VOAG department that if the bond issue doesn't pass, they would like to put a school farm up there. I think that's a great idea. At some point, might not be during you know, my lifetime or whatever, we, uh, to me, we want to have all the land we can and have the opportunity there if you need to build a school or you need to build some kind of facility, you have it. 
the worst thing is when you don't have land when you need it. So I think that it was a wise decision. Of course, everyone, when they hear $10,000 or whatever it was, $9,500 an acre, they go, oh my, we all know what land's bringing. We've got land right here in the city limits contiguous with our school. I think the proof is in the pudding. I mean, I really think that was a wise decision. But I thought it was better to be answered by Brad to start with. Gene, do you want to add to that? No. Just, just um, one of our jobs and is as school board members and and representing you is to have vision for the future. Um, somebody had vision for the future to to buy the land where the middle school sits right now. I don't even I don't know who did that. It was before. Maybe some of you know that. I don't know, but. Some board had the vision to get that land, and we needed it at some point. And if we don't build on it right now, at some point, this community, I'm hoping and praying, is progressive enough and keeps alive enough and grows enough to need that. So that's, that's why it was. It wasn't, gosh, I want to build a softball field. It, was, it would be great to have a softball field, but we can't even do anything if we don't have, have the land. So. That was the reasoning and for vision. Yes, John. I can tell you that um, enrollment-wise, and we heard this was coming with the census. What I sent as far as enrollment, the matrix, I, I think I about know it, yeah. That, you know, we have, uh, oh my, my, 70 seniors. We have 90 kindergarten, 90 first grade, 100 second grade and 91 third graders all in Clay Center, okay? But at the high school, we go 70 seniors, 70 juniors, and uh, 80 sophomores. So in Clay Center, we're starting to see some growth. I think that everyone, and this is not probably a very professional term to use, but it's the one I always hear, what do we talk about in rural America? Brain drain. Our kids graduate, they go to college or they go to the workforce and they end up in Johnson County or Sedgwick County or someplace instead of back here. I think it's everyone's goal to bring people home, to bring young people home. I think we're starting to see that, honestly. I think we're starting to see young people that graduate from college or graduate from a Votech school or whatever, and they want to come home. The clientele that I work with most of the time, of course, are young families. I don't have a lot of people that are looking to retire call me and ask about our community. But those young families, here's what they ask me. I said this at Wakefield. Academically, they want to know how your schools are, how they perform. Academics. You know what the second thing that come out of their mouth? Recreational opportunities for my children. Recreational opportunities. That is big. I grew up on a farm. I was 15 years old. My dad said, Mike, baseball is over for you. You're not going to play anymore. I need you on the tractor. You know? Um, he said, they have you all year long. In the summer, you're mine. Kids today, parents today, I was guilty of it as well. I've got one left in high school, two out. But the demands, the pressures, the involvement, the activities, and we could sit here philosophically and talk about the pros and cons of that and both be right for hours and hours and hours. But the reality of it is that's a big deal today to our, to our students and to our parents. So I didn't mean to get off on a tangent, but I think that's, that's the world we live in. That's the society we live in right now. We want to be appealing to young families. Do we compete with Abilene and Wamego and the other schools? Yes, we do. Manhattan, Junction City or whatever. 
academically, our test scores, our staff, all put us up against everybody. Facility-wise, we're in pretty good shape. We have some needs, probably, um, or we're a little bit behind. If you've been in some of the places in some of the athletic facilities, not all, but in some. Questions? We, we do so, I, I might share this. Superintendent at Cheney is a friend of mine. Um, been a friend of mine for a long time. They had a similar I believe their LOB reduction was like eight mils, and they wanted to improve facilities, the wraparound financing, same thing. I, I don't know exactly whether it was $12 million or $14 million, but they got eight mils in relief, and they just, he shared publicly, we can't put together a better plan than this financially as far as opportunity and tax impact. If it's right, you know what to do. If it's wrong, you know what to do. But I think we have put together, the board has put together, they're trying to give you everyone a say on moving the, the stadium or whatever because there's a lot of emotionality. But I, I firmly believe it's a really good plan. We're trying to educate. You're going to have to make that decision come November 4th. Brad, Gene, anything to add? Jacqueline, did you have something that I missed? Thanks so much for coming. We're going to stick around. Greg, Bud, um, if you would like to see any of the uh, facilities here at Clay Center Community High School that we showed in pictures, we will show you those. Otherwise, thank you so much. Call me, email me, stop by the office. Um, if things pop up, I'll do the best job I can to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Next oh, next Tuesday night. Tell your friends, tell your family. We'll be back in here next Tuesday night, the 30th, um, same time. Thank you.